get into literature. Before then, uh, they are treated as these natural history phenomena. Um, and in fact, you can put a very precise date on what I would call the discovery of vampires. Um, it's in um, Eastern Europe on the borders um, of the, the Habsburg Empire, which is the um, Austro-Hungarian Empire. Um, and it's really when um, Enlightenment um, scientists and philosophers um, and physicians come into contact with East European folklore. Um, and so in 1725, you can be very precise about this, that's the first uh, official recording of the word vampire in documents. Professor Nick Groom presents a rich and eerie history of the vampire as a strikingly complex being that has been used to express the traumas and contradictions of the human condition. Tonight, we talk about vampires. That and more coming right up on My Alien Life. My Alien Life is recorded live from atop the Northern Rocky Mountains and is available on Spotify, Stitcher, iTunes, and everywhere fine podcasts are found. My website is at www.myalienlifepodcast.com. There you will find my email address, all previously recorded shows, and more. I am Cameron Brower. This is My Alien Life, and the podcast starts right now. My Alien Life Podcast. guest tonight has been a lecturer at the University of Exeter in Southwest England, a senior lecturer in post-medieval literature at the University of Bristol, and among other things, he writes about vampires. Nick Groom, thank you so much for being here, and welcome, sir. It's a pleasure. Thank you very much, Cameron. Yeah, we were talking earlier about um, just the circumstances that you're in. You're kind of uh, um, not exactly under 100% quarantine, but it's mostly volunteer, correct? Uh, that's correct. So I'm um, currently in Macau. I've recently taken up an appointment as Professor of Literature and English at the University of Macau. Um, and your listeners may, may know that it's uh, we, we're just on the edge of uh, mainland China, uh, very close to Hong Kong. Um, but uh, yes, unfortunately, with the coronavirus um, having a hit, um, the university has been uh, very helpful in making recommendations um, in terms of staying in. Um, and um, taking temperatures of people regularly um, and uh, giving out face masks and so forth. Um, and so I'm happy to abide by those recommendations. Um, and I'm yeah, sitting in my apartment looking out over the border with China and uh, getting a lot of reading and writing. Done. So you're originally or, or recently came from um, Exeter in southwest England. And um, what brought you to uh, where you're at right now? Yeah, so I've been, I was a professor at Exeter for um, I think 12 years. Um, so I've, uh, I've worked in various universities, uh, both um, in the UK and in the US. So I was uh, at um, Stanford for, uh, as a visiting professor and also um, had the same appointment at Chicago a few years ago. Um, but really, the, the opportunity to work in Macau came um, as a surprise. Uh, but it's, uh, it's towards the end of my um, career. It just seems to be too good an opportunity uh, really to, uh, to let go. Um, it's, it's, it's a new challenge. Um, it's, uh, it's an opportunity uh, to work with, with different colleagues um, in, a, in a very vibrant um, and uh, visionary um, university and of course in different parts um, of the world. So it's not without some regrets that I um, left England, uh, but I'll be back again there, um, I expect, uh, later in the year. Um, in the meantime, um, 
it's very, very good uh, working in a new, in a new environment. In fact, Macau was particularly interested um, in um, inviting me to the university because I specialise in the Gothic. Um, so although I've written books on various other subjects, uh, such as um, uh, authenticity and forgery, on um, the ballad tradition, uh, on the seasons um, in England, and also, in fact, the history of the, of the Union Jack. I'm interested in, in, in environmentalism uh, and uh, questions of regional and national identity. Uh, but I've really focused very much on the Gothic um, in the past few years. So that's looking at the supernatural um, in literature and, uh, and culture uh, more generally. And really, uh, what I've tried to do is to reshape uh, the way that we think uh, about um, Gothic culture and, and connect it with other areas, uh, such as politics uh, or medical history um, or indeed the environment. Seems like younger people right now um, are definitely into Gothic studies. When did that um, change? And and uh, did you ever think that you would be you'd be teaching Gothic studies as as something that people were um, becoming more interested in? Yes, well, certainly when I was a, a student in the 1980s and then uh, when I became a postgraduate, um, Gothic um, studies um, had, had certainly um, captured the imagination, um, I think, at that stage. So, uh, for example, it's possible to go to lectures on, um, on Dracula um, and Frankenstein um, and so forth. Um, and in fact, it was probably the 80s um, that really, I think, uh, changed the, the, uh, the way that, uh, that academics and, uh, and teachers thought about the Gothic. They realized that, um, how much uh, there was there. And it also, for me, um, connected with contemporary culture, with um, goth um, rock music, for example, with um, this uh, wonderful succession of, um, of films um, and then TV series that we've had. So it's, it's a very topical, it's very relevant, it's very contemporary. Um, and it does speak uh, to our fears, um, to our passions um, and our needs. Um, in, in a way that uh, not every aspect of, of culture uh, really does. At the same time, I talk about it being very contemporary. The thing that really interests me most about the Gothic is taking it back into history and really trying to put a much earlier date uh, for the emergence um, of Gothic uh, than most uh, readers, I think, are perhaps aware of. So, um, you know, a lot of people will tell you that the Gothic begins in 1764 with the Castle of Otranto, um, a, a supernatural novel uh, by Horace Walpole. And that's true in terms of literature. And in fact, uh, the Gothic had been discussed uh, for a good 150 years before that as a political movement. Um, so it connects with issues of national identity, uh, with the uh, development of uh, a capitalist society, um, entrepreneurship, um, the empire, also it's connected with the Protestant church. Um, and all those aspects and what then feed into what we would now recognize um, as, um, as Gothic novels and indeed Gothic culture uh, more generally. Uh, but that story hasn't really been told um, in the way that it, uh, that it perhaps should have been. So that's really where my work has been focused, pushing back the Gothic into an earlier period uh, of politics um, and identity, and uh, and things like architecture and gardening um, and um, and painting as well. How did you find yourself jumping from Gothic studies and traditional literature into vampires? Yeah, well, I think it's a, it's, it's a very good question, um, Cameron. So um, I became recognised um, as an expert, I say, in the early Gothic, um, and um, certainly in terms of the British media. Um, I mean, I, I don't go about broadcasting this, but I have been called a prof of goth, and so they would have me on various shows um, talking, talking about, yes, I so don't introduce myself to that, um, talking about um, the long history um, of the gothic, and I, I did a, um, a, a little book on that, so a very short introduction. And then I edited a series of gothic uh, novels, um, including Castle of the Tranto and uh, The Monk uh, by Matthew Lewis, which is a horror um, novel, uh, The Italian by Anne Radcliffe, and then more recently Frankenstein. Um, but the interest in vampires, certainly, of course, it lurks there in the shadows, one might say, um, of the Gothic uh, through uh, novels such as Dracula and more recently uh, franchises such as Twilight. But it's really working uh, with 
uh, medical researchers uh, that made me realize that uh, there was much more to be done in this area of Gothic, which focused on the vampire in particular. Um, so there's a research center um, at the University of Exeter in the UK called the uh, Welcome um, Center. Uh, Welcome is a medical charity. The Welcome Center for Cultures and Environments of Health. So I got very involved in that. Um, and that really changed my thinking um, and enabled me to approach uh, the vampire, not just from the perspective of the Gothic, but now from the perspectives um, of, um, of medical history and areas of social science. And that's what really interested me about vampires. Because they're not like ghosts um, in um, social and cultural history and literature. Um, they don't have that intangibility. Um, they're treated, at least in the beginning, as um, actual physical, material, tangible beings that are investigated uh, by physicians um, and, uh, and the authorities um, and indeed legal um, experts, magistrates and so forth. So they're treated very, very seriously. Um, and that became a way um, of thinking about vampires and tracing a different sort of history. Uh, but certainly it does take in the supernatural. It takes in many elements um, of, of the Gothic. Uh, but this is really work that covers areas of blood superstition, uh, so again, a lot of politics, um, again, the rise of capitalism, uh, but from this particular perspective of this strange being, um, which is both, you know, believed in and accepted, and at the same time is also metaphorical, uh, and which obviously can't um, exist. So then I realized there was plenty to be said about vampires. Um, and there was a whole history that hadn't really been put together, um, and one which, uh, you know, it's wonderful to have the opportunity uh, from Yale University Press to, uh, to therefore write, uh, to write this book and uh, suggest uh, some new ways of thinking about vampires. And your book is called The Vampire, A New History. And this is kind of a long question in my, my I usually have long questions, but uh, what I want to know, anyone who reads about vampires or looks into reading about vampires and their history um, they obviously have a, a preconceived notion based upon maybe something that they've read or watched on TV or seen on the internet. Do you feel that there's a definite origin history and morphology that comes from a, a definite starting point or did uh, vampires original originate from several origins in, in, in different time periods? Yeah, well, I think that, that that's the crucial question really. So I think a lot of people quite um, understandably uh, will consider maybe Bram Stoker writing Dracula right. um, kicks off the whole vampire uh, phenomenon. And of course, that became incredibly influential in 20th century film um, and uh, it is so up to this day. But what I argue in this book as a whole prehistory to Dracula, uh, when it, it takes about 100 years uh, before vampires get into literature, before then uh, they are treated as these natural history phenomena. Um, and in fact, you can put a very precise date on what I would call the discovery of vampires. Um, it's in um, Eastern Europe on the borders um, of the, the Habsburg Empire, which is the um, Austro-Hungarian Empire. Um, and it's really when um, Enlightenment um, scientists and philosophers um, and physicians come into contact with East European folklore. Um, and so in 1725, you can be very precise about this, that's the first uh, official recording of the word vampire in documents um, that are relating to um, the investigation of the authorities of the Habsburg Empire. And then within the next um, six or seven years, there are a series of um, like task forces. It's a bit like the X-Files. These strange things going on on the borders of the empire. Um, and so... Um, the arm is sent in uh, with medical officers um, to go and um, investigate forensically and perform autopsies um, and really try to discover what's going on um, in terms of the dead apparently rising, uh, preying on the living, um, sucking their blood and spreading um, this contagion um, of vampirism. So it's taken very, very seriously um, and it is reported in medical journals and then it sort of spreads across Europe uh, like wildfire. 
uh, market up until it becomes, um, you know, sensation. Um, and uh, there's a lot of people writing and talking about vampires in all of these disciplines, whether it's um, in terms of medical research, in terms of philosophy, um, in terms of um, theology, um, in terms of um, the law. Um, and it's those areas that really build up the momentum of the figure of the vampire um, and uh, scrutinize it um, and try to uh, really probe uh, what its implications are. And that's what I find particularly um, fascinating because all of these areas are defining what it is to be human. Um, they're, if you like, they're sort of discourses, they're uh, ways of trying to understand um, you know, the limits um, of what it is to be human as opposed to be you know, alive or dead, human or animal, um, and so forth. Um, and so the vampire gets drawn into those debates um, about these new ways, these new enlightenment um, ways of thinking um, about uh, the capacity um, of the human, of the human being. And so they're incredibly up-to-date, um, modern tools for thinking. I call them thought experiments. They're like thought experiments that move across these different areas um, of, of investigation and really provide metaphors uh, to help, uh, for example, philosophers think about uh, testimony um, and evidence um, and uh, the whole notion of being. One of the earlier questions that I was going to ask was, are vampires something that came out of literature or did literature come out of vampires? And um, I guess post-1725, I'm wondering in the next hundred years, between 1725 and 1825, how many people were writing about vampires? Yeah, so um, I really want to stress that um, the vampires are already there uh, before... Um, writers get hold of them. Um, and so they're, they're being written about, let's say, by, um, you know, by uh, medical researchers. So, uh, for example, um, between, um, what would it be, in 1732, there are 17 articles published in medical journals. Um, the next year, there are 12 books and four dissertations, and then another 22 works. So this is all happening um, in terms of what is considered to be cutting edge um, medical research, and that's where the writing starts. And in the middle of the century, the first poem um, is published on a vampire, uh, which draws very strongly on these um, earlier reports, and it's published um, in, a, in a natural history um, journal. Um, so it's almost uh, you know, presented as um, simply a way of reimagining um, this, this phenomenon that's, that's being hotly disputed. Um, and yeah, appearing in Traveller's Reports, appearing in a lot of uh, passing comments. Uh, it's used in, uh, the vampire's used in, um, in Britain, for example, in 1732 again, um, as, a, as a political allegory. Um, so um, there's a stage debate in which um, the, the participants uh, understand that it's a way of talking about uh, political oppression in Eastern Europe. Um, so it, it takes a while uh, before... Uh, the vampire sort of gets into mainstream literature. And certainly in English, um, it's, it's John Polidori who writes the first vampire tale. Um, and he's a, he's a doctor. He's a Lord Byron's physician. Um, and uh, he's attracted to the figure of the vampire, writes, writes the first story. Now, vampires had appeared in a bit of um, English poetry before then. In fact, Byron himself uh, writes about them, for example, and Robert Southey writes about an Islamic vampire. And what's interesting about those accounts is that they appear with footnotes explaining uh, the historical and the medical uh, significance of vampires. In fact, when John Polidori's uh, story first appears, it also has an accompanying essay that talks about the evidence uh, that they believed to be for the existence uh, of vampires in Eastern Europe. Um, and then... Polidori's, um, it's, it's, it's a short story, it's a novella, uh, really, uh, then really uh, does ignite uh, the, the reading public um, in uh, Britain and indeed across Europe. Um, and it's put straight away put onto the stage and becomes very popular um, as a play 
And then lots and lots of um, writers um, are using the figure of the vampire. So this carries on throughout the 19th century across Europe, indeed in North America. Um, very often the stories have uh, medical um, experts and doctors, uh, for example. They don't lose that. Um, interestingly, most of the vampires that are presented are female. You can see this in um, Lefanu's story, uh, Carmilla, for example, which again draws very um, strongly um, on those earlier East European reports. And so the vampire uh, you know, proliferates um, as a way of 19th century writers uh, again, trying to understand the human predicament and using the vampire as a way of uh, sort of running alongside uh, medical research, uh, things like animal experimentation, uh, blood transfusion, um, even, even dentistry um, as well, um, and, uh, and um, cosmetic surgery um, and so forth. So it becomes a way um, of commenting um, and understanding uh, medical advances. And also, in fact, in, in terms of psychology um, and psychic research, um, as you probably know, there's a huge 19th century interest um, in, in the psychic and the, in the occult um, and so forth. And there's a whole area of research on what they call psychic, uh, vampires that feed on energy. Um, so vampires are sort of everywhere um, in, the, in the 19th century. Um, and it's not just writers of uh, fiction who... Uh, who are, who are still using them. Uh, they're used, for example, by Karl Marx um, in a lot of his writing. Um, and so he is using metaphors of blood sucking um, and uh, predation um, and quite explicitly uh, vampirism um, in, a, in a lot of his uh, metaphors for the, the effect that capitalism has um, on the individual. In fact, Marx intended to write um, an essay uh, on vampires. What do most people believe that... Uh and I'm talking about in the 20th century and, and currently where do most people believe vampires originated and how did they come up with that idea and um, where do they have it wrong? Um, I don't think they necessarily have it wrong. It's just, I think that it's, I think it's interesting uh, from the um, perspective of the 21st century um, to, to realize that vampires have, a, have this longer history. And I certainly don't want to patronize my readers and tell them what to think about uh, things like true blood, for example. I think that people are well able to make the connections themselves. But of course, the, the, the way that the vampire uh, becomes um, a, a reminder of the different ways in which we're shaped by society, and as society changes, um, it becomes a, a way of thinking uh, that, can, that can help us um, through um, some of the... Uh, problems that we might be encountering. In fact, we talked at the beginning about the fact that I'm, um, you know, in um, in Asia um, and uh, the the threat of the, of the um, coronavirus. Well, vampires have been very much associated with contagion uh, because um, it was only until fairly recently, uh, the middle of the 19th century, when John Snow uh, researched cholera, that the spread of disease uh, was actually understood. So there were lots of theories about how um, disease was, uh, was, was spread among communities. Uh, was it uh, on the breath, for example? So uh, patients were, uh, would be uh, wrapped up um, in, uh, with, with face masks. Um, it was believed that possibly words uh, could carry um, disease. Um, so, so patients were with silence. Um, the look um, of, a, of an infected person uh, was at one time believed uh, to be potentially um, fatal. Um, so patients were blindfolded. So you're dealing with this sort of invisible forces. Um, and of course, we now uh, are able to control these things much more, much more effectively. But it's interesting for me that, that the vampire becomes a figure uh, which then sort of attracts these different ways of thinking about uh, problems such as the spread um, of disease. And that, for example, accounts for what's effectively the weaponized gaze um, of the vampire. The fact that it has um, the, the way that the vampire looks at you is, is a way of, of overcoming and bewitching, uh, bewitching you. Um, so it incorporates those sorts of elements um, of scientific thinking um, of the time. 
from a historical perspective, based on um, that early research data from from the 1700s, 1725 to, to 1800, or s- sometime around that period, what are some facts known by you that, that you have, know of that isn't known by uh, readers now when we read about vampires? Um, well, one of the things that particularly interested me um, about um, the importance of, of blood is a number of blood superstitions uh, that there there were, um, and I mean I, I found this material fascinating. Is that um, there, there'd been a sort of dream of blood transfusion um, that uh, particularly um, after uh, William Harvey discovers the circulation of the blood, and whole, the whole idea of circulation uh, becomes very powerful um, through the 17th century, and in particular into the 18th century about how. You know, not only blood circulates, but um, objects can circulate, commodities can circulate, ideas can circulate, and so forth. But tied to blood, I mean, the blood superstitions go back um, into the earliest times of civilization. Um, but you have um, Sir Christopher Wren, for example, the better known as an architect in the 1660s, injecting his dog with wine uh, to get it drunk, um, and then to consider the effects um, of uh, tampering with blood. So he then suggested uh, that uh, what would happen if the blood of one dog was introduced into another dog, would it change the dog's character? Would it make a, a quiet dog more aggressive if it was a um, hunting breed, for example? And then this experiment was actually done on a person. Now, Arthur Koga, um, who was quite a, um, a lively uh, <laughs> chap, um, was uh, the subject of an experiment to calm down um, his, his temper by having the blood of a lamb transfused into his, into his veins. And uh, the idea was that lambs are symbolically meek and mild. Well, of course, anybody who's seen lambs in the field uh, will know that they're actually quite frisky and frolicsome. Um, and Koga survived the operation. It was actually uh, performed a second time. But then he asked for charity because he felt that he'd been transformed into a different species. He was now a hybrid. He started calling himself Koga the sheep. Um, so this relationship between the human and the non-human, this sort of cross-species um, interaction, one of the things it does is to begin to diminish that sense that humans are you know, exceptional at the sort of uh, top of creation and so forth. And in fact, they have far more uh, affinities uh, with, uh, with, with animals and with other sort of living sentient creatures. Of course, the vampires then become a way of thinking about that because vampires are not human, but they're so close to being human uh, that they um, trouble us um, in our definitions and distinctions about what it is to be human. And so this, this thinking about blood um, and the significance of blood um, is absolutely crucial and then runs through the whole of the 19th century. Um, blood transfusions um, are now being successfully performed, first of all, between uh, dogs again, and then and then on humans. Uh, there's a, a whole, uh, what I think I call a <laughs> hemodynamic discourse uh, that images of blood um, appear everywhere. Um, and a lot of the older superstitions about blood are revived. So drinking blood um, is seen as a cure for things like epilepsy. Um, Hans Christian Andersen witnesses um, this, and at the end of the 19th century, the very decade that Dracula um, is published, um, blood drinking, uh, the actual fresh blood um, of a slaughtered um, ox, uh, which was considered to be a way of uh, raising um, low spirits, of uh, invigorating um, patients, um, and so forth. The blood has this sort of, it was seen to have these magical um, qualities, that it was a, a very much rejuvenating, literally rejuvenating um, substance. Now, that has also come back today. Um, so one of the projects that developed out of my uh, vampire research was working with um, an epidemiologist uh, at the University of Exeter, and also uh, a theatre group uh, called Four of Swords. And we uh, developed a performance that was uh, using vampire stories and that blood history, the history of the superstition surrounding blood, with contemporary epigenetics. Um, in other words, the fact that we all know that a, um, a drop of blood at the scene of a crime um, can contain a DNA profile. Um, but also that same drop of blood can give a much uh, more detailed uh, 
profile of uh, your um, dietary habits, uh, whether you've ever smoked, and also in fact how long you're likely to live. Um, so there's this enormous amount of information uh, that that's sort of contained um, in this substance. It's still being investigated um, and researched today. Um, and so I'd say vampires are good to think with, and we sort of found that um, a lot of the ways in which vampires have been presented in the past uh, was uh, a way of trying to um, come to terms with with, uh, with with blood conditions, which don't present in the same way um, as things uh, like uh, well measles, for example, or um, or indeed pneumonia. They often don't have physical symptoms, as you can see. However, uh, they certainly can have very debilitating effects um, on in terms of people's sort of energy um, and memory um, and, uh, and general well-being. In the addition of uh, well. In addition to um, ingesting blood for strength and, and things like that, and 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 there was also um, bloodletting and leaching. Um, are those two things yes. that uh, it's it's basically the <laughs> the antithesis of, of ingesting blood, but still that that came about as as some sort of positive that could help. How? Yes. Yeah, so that, that that's that's another another sort of very relevant area. Um, is that certainly you know, bloodletting uh, goes back to at least in medieval times and probably earlier. Um, of course, doctors, uh, the, the practice of, uh, of, of um, medicine was called leech craft, um, and uh, using leeches uh, to suck blood uh, was, uh, was sort of part of the um, armory um, of the uh, medical expert. But then, just come back, um, you can buy leeches online, um, and uh, they are used to clean wounds. But also things like bloodletting can actually have very significant health uh, benefits. If you suffer, for example, from hemochromatosis, uh, which is um, having uh, too much iron, too many red blood cells, um, that uh, can, can be very debilitating and ultimately fatal. Um, in fact, I speak from direct experiences, and my grandmother uh, sadly died of it and it was undiagnosed. Um, it can actually be um, dealt with by simply uh, giving blood every month. Um, and so that sort of bloodletting uh, can, can not only be a way of managing um, that condition, but then does increase people's overall um, health and, and well-being. So certainly one of the things we wanted to do uh, with uh, what we call the Dr. Dracula uh, project was raise people's awareness um, of these blood conditions uh, that have been, you know, I think for centuries there's been an awareness of these rather elusive uh, conditions. Um, and vampires use it as a way uh, to try to uh, to try to explain them. So, well, no, there is uh, sort of medical evidence that you know you should go and get tested um, if you believe you're suffering uh, these symptoms, um, and uh, then um, hopefully uh, you'll be able to respond to the cure as well. Uh, so that's important. You know, just by generally giving blood uh, an organ donation is, is is very important as well. Um, and so, because this thinking has got me into areas of medical history, it does bear um, on uh, contemporary uh, medical practice and, and the biosciences more generally, um, I think. So from the very unlikely route <laughs> of gothic literature in the vampires, uh, we come up uh, with ways um, of, of living in the world today. I think. Rabies is a disease inflicted by bite. Was there any relationship of, of rabies or uh, and vampires? Oh, certainly. So a, a, again, it's the um, not being able to understand or diagnose um, you know, the, the particular condition. Uh, but uh, one of the earliest uh, reports of, if not a vampire, something called a Rocolocas, uh, which is um, a, a Greek uh, version, uh, was reported by uh, the French uh, botanist and natural historian, um, uh, Piton de Tonfort. Um, and he describes a community which is being terrorized by a vampire. Uh, but he diagnoses it as that actually uh, that they're probably suffering from the from the bite of a mad dog, uh, and so that that's an image that you see uh, throughout the 18th and 19th centuries uh, because it does it obviously it changes um, the character. Um, it's seen as a, as a cross species um, infection, uh, but it's also interesting because it, it suggests or hints at the connection between vampires and werewolves. <laughs> Bye. <laughs>
Hey everybody, it's Cam Brower and I'd like you to check out my Alien Life patron page. What is it? Think of it as an online tip jar. My Alien Life patron page is a website that gives everyone in the world an opportunity to become a patron and support artists they believe in. The great thing about supporting My Alien Life is you get to decide how much you feel comfortable contributing to each podcast. My goal is to keep doing at least two podcasts each week. And it's okay if you want to put a cap on how much you'd like to support every month so you don't go over your budget. As you know, some weeks I get a burst of energy and I want to produce a lot of new content. I'll keep producing episode after episode and you'll get all the content. I won't hold back and make you pay for extra content. And if you just want to listen without becoming a patron, that's awesome. You still get to hear all my Alien Life podcasts for free. It's expensive to make a podcast. There's electronic gear, web domain fees, web hosting fees, t-shirts, postage stamps, tinfoil hats, alien assault spray, and more. No matter what you decide, please always listen to the podcast. That's what I really want. We're a team, and your support is what keeps people like us going. Thank you so much for being amazing, and keep listening to My Alien Life Podcast. Um, and this is something which is evident in East European folklore, that the two um, do sort of coexist or sort of overlap. Um, and it's interesting that as the vampire is written about in the 19th century, um, and certainly uh, for Bram Stoker, one of his major sources um, is uh, a book by Sabine Baring Gould called The Book of Werewolves, which is the first werewolf book um, in English, which is gathers together uh, these tales of lycanthropy um, and, and shape-shifting and, frankly, savagery. Um, and uh, that's incorporated into later vampire narratives. And of course, um, in, in Dracula, the Count uh, can metamorphose um, into a wolf. Um, and so that becomes one of the, what, what, uh, another feature. Um, it's, it's, it's a way of, if you like, harnessing or enlisting uh, these, these, these wider concerns. And of course, werewolves, you know, present the same uh, questions uh, that vampires do in terms of, you know, where does the human stop and the animal begin? Um, and um, are, are werewolves, or should they be treated uh, the same? Do they have um, uh, sort of a cause um, or legitimacy uh, for their actions? Can you uh, prosecute somebody if they're, if they're, if they're sort of a savage species um, as opposed to being a thinking, uh, reasoning, rational human being? When do we first start reading of methods to repel and uh, eliminate vampires? Uh, that's, that's a great question, and uh, very, very quickly. Um, so staking a vampire um, is certainly um, something that the East European um, uh, communities are doing in the, in the very earliest days. Um, and the whole idea of, of staking corpses um, goes back much earlier in history in what we call some deviant burials, where you find... Uh, corpses. The, the basic, I mean, the reason why you stake something is to stop it getting out of its coffin. So you, you nail it to the floor or to, or to the ground. Um, also putting uh, rocks in the mouth to break the um, teeth, um, severing tendons, uh, decapitation, taking the heart out, uh, cremation, uh, throwing the ashes into a uh, fast-running river. Um, all, all of these, all of these are good ways um, of getting rid of vampires. Um, there was uh, an early uh, vampire. Slayer called the Count de Cabreras, um, who dispatched at least three vampires in, in, in different ways um, in the 1730s. Um, so, in, in fact, he was also um, a, a captain in, a, um, in an in infantry uh, regiment. So, again, you get that connection with the military and with the authorities. Um, in terms of garlic, uh, that's a very early uh, prophylactic, uh, if you like, a way of uh, warding off vampires, as is uh, rubbing yourself with vampires' blood. Uh, it's supposed to repel them, um, or drinking vampires' blood, um, eating soil from a vampire's grave. Uh, there are other ways as well. Using hawthorn um, is quite a magical, uh, sort of magical timber uh, to uh, to keep them away. Uh, spreading the ground uh, with uh, with grains of incense, uh, wrapping the uh, the vampire in uh, the vampire's body in um, in, in dog roses and so forth. So there, there are lots and lots of ways. I'm trying to, trying to keep them away. Um, there's an overlap with uh, Catholicism, so holy water, um, consecrated wafers, um, and so forth. 
um, are, are seen as, as, as ways of, of guarding yourself um, against them. Um, and um, the problem is, though, that sort of vampires, although they're very tangible and they do have this sort of physical being, they're also able um, to pass through um, locked doors. Uh, they can metamorphose not only into wolves, uh, but also into, into rats or, um, or bats. Um, they can become uh, diffuse and uh, turn into mist and so forth. So all these things, are, you know, Dracula himself uh, is able to, all these strategies or techniques uh, or abilities, uh, Dracula is able to deploy um, as ways of, uh, of trying to infiltrate um, English society. So they are, they're, they're, they're pretty difficult to, uh, <laughs> to get rid of. But of course, interestingly, in, in Dracula, um, he actually um, ends up being um, killed with a, uh, with, with a large knife, uh, a cookery, a, a Gurkha's um, knife. So the whole notion of um, staking and decapitation did in fact happen to him, which may leave the door open for the return of Dracula. So you brought up Dracula. Is there, uh, is there other names in literature for, for a vampire that, that we're not familiar with um, other than Dracula? Well, I was very thrilled with uh, but I mean, having, having written the book to return to Dracula to see how much research Bram Stoker had done. He had spent many years uh, researching vampires, and he uses a, a lots of hints um, of this earlier history and of the forensics of vampires um, in his um, in his novel. Um, but it certainly, uh, he comes at the end of the 19th century. There'd been very renowned vampires earlier on. Uh, there's a long-running um, serial um, called Barney the Vampire. Uh, which uh, ran to about half a million words, I think, um, which uh, has uh, the vampire involved in a series of um, escapades and adventures uh, before he finally tires of his vampire life and uh, commits suicide by throwing himself into a volcano. Um, there's a uh, uh, news um, female vampire, Carmilla, uh, who was also a very, uh, very renowned example. Uh, but there were, there were many, uh, there were many, the vampires were very popular. Um, and there are some rather overlooked vampires, uh, such as Marjorie of Quether, uh, which is a Devonian uh, vampire, uh, written about, again, by Sabine Bering Gould, the expert on werewolves. In fact, when Dracula was published, it was favorably compared with Marjorie of Quether. And the interesting thing for me is that there are several of the same sort of elements in both of those stories, um, that they're presenting vampires as being topical and up to date. In fact, the novel Dracula was praised, um, I think, by Punch magazine for its up to datedness. Um, so, although it has this this early research in the medical history and the superstition and things like the garlic and the um, the consecrated wafers and so forth, it's also packed full um, of things like Kodak cameras, um, the sort of the telegraph, uh, Winchester rifles. Um, so, it's, it's very much a novel for the 1890s. Um, and Marjorie of Quether has the same uh, sort of very uh, contemporary relevant references um, also to um, to the law um, and to um, legal ownership. And of course, that's something that people tend to forget about Dracula um, is in Bram Stoker's novel. Um, he speculates a lot in real estate. Um, and uh, in fact, Jonathan Harker said he'd make a very good solicitor because <laughs> of his eye for detail. Yeah. So he's very good at planning. Um, and uh, conveyancing um, and uh, importing. Um, I, don't, I, I don't know who would want to uh, uh, actually engage Count Dracula as a solicitor, um, as a legal representative, uh, but it's important to see him as modern, uh, not to see him as a figure from the archaic past, but to see him as, as, as somebody who is of the world now. Um, and that's one of the abiding and enduring qualities that vampires have, that they can be reinvented for the present. Um, for the near future. Is there a varying degree of vampirism or is, you know, is there a hybrid vampire or humans with vampire characteristics? Um, I mean, that, that's, that's a very difficult question to, to answer. I mean, there are individuals who identify themselves as sanguinarians. In other words, they actually uh, physically require blood um, as a, as a necessity. Blood is something that's very difficult to ingest. I mean, you, you can drink blood. You can't drink very much of it. It's so salty that it's mimetic. Uh, so it's, it makes you sick. But there aren't really enough sanguinarians uh, for any um, anything detailed or sustained uh, medical research. Um, and of course, um, many sanguinarians don't want to admit themselves 
uh, uh, sort of publicly um, to uh, to those sort of activities anyway. Um, so there are certainly groups who do who do identify. I think another reason for that would be the proliferation of, of vampires across a whole range of media um, in the past few years um, has really come up with you know sparkly vampires and green vampires and ethical vampires and vampires with a conscience um, so forth. So you get um, film and TV vampires now maybe subsist off uh, blood substitutes or by uh, raiding blood banks rather than actually by um, preying on, on individuals. So again, they're becoming a way of thinking about questions of responsibility um, and sustainability and difference um, in, I think, some very, very, some very exciting ways. Um, and it's, it's this constant nature um, of, the, of the figure of the vampire um, is, to, is to be challenging us um, in terms of our own um, human identity and responsibilities. There's some talk in uh, Greek mythology as well as uh, I think, I think I got to think back, but maybe the name Ambrosio, um, maybe uh, another, another vampire in Turkey. And then surprisingly, one of the places that I wouldn't have expected would be um, a vampire. And I, I can't even pronounce the name, but uh, in China, there was, there is, there's some um, historical literature about vampirism. Um, is that is that yeah, a, is, is that evidence of these you know uh, popping up because of what came first, the literature or the actual evidence? Well, I think that every culture and civilization has had a fear of blood suckers, um, and so you can you can go back to you know ancient Assyria. Um, you can certainly in um, in Greek and Roman. Uh, mythology um, in Anglo-Saxon times, and of course um, globally, um, it's in China or Japan and so forth. Um, but I, would, I don't really want to draw a distinction uh, between blood-sucking monsters and vampires. Um, so that's what I'm really trying to trying to argue is that the vampire is a particular figure that emerges at a particular moment, and it emerges as an object of scientific investigation. Um, and it's only later um, that what are called vampires then get into uh, literature and culture. So I think that it's, it, 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 you can't really uh, push, uh, and, you know, what I'm trying to say, I think, that vampires only become vampires when they're called vampires. And before then, there's just a general range of um, undead bloodsuckers um, that certainly do uh, merge through different, different cultures, uh, but they're not vampires um, in the identifiable sense of the word. Historically speaking, in, in folklore, is it true that the vampire's first victim would often be his wife? Yeah, that's um, certainly uh, the vampire that emerges um, in the 18th century. Why is that? Yeah, um, that's, that's just odd to me, but, you know. Yes, it, it, well, but they, they would tend to prey on um, close um, relatives, um, friends, and, 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 and family. Um, the, I think because it's, they have this uncanny quality of changing those very personal relationships. So somebody's um, husband or wife comes back from the dead. It's, it's bad enough maybe for the community if they're going around um, slaughtering um, neighbors. Uh, but the real fear and, and the threat and the anxiety comes when they get to their nearest and dearest, because that then, of course, begins to throw all sorts of questions um, about whether you want people returning down from the dead. So it becomes, it becomes a way of concentrating and intensifying um, that, that, that relationship, um, I think, or those, those sort of possibilities, those fears. Um, and it's, it's something which, you know, it's thinking you know somebody um, and realizing that they've become, you know, a different species, uh, they become entirely alien um, to you. Um, that, I think that really does embody um, a profound nightmarish uh, fear uh, that, uh, that people have. Um, so, so in that sense, it does, it does go to the core um, of um, those um, you know, anxieties. And what about the part where vampires, I mean, are, um, where did it come from? 
where they actually you know, come from the earth or, or they um, sleep in a, in a coffin or um, bury themselves during the day. Is, is that part of the, the lore? Um, it was, so the early, uh, the early 18th century vampires um, are the risen dead, um, so, some, sometimes because they've already been infected. Um, so vampirism is something which uh, can, can spread, um, and they are rising from the dead, and they are uh, vampirizing, they're infecting um, their victims. Um, and also, in fact, livestock as well, so again, it's a cross-species um, condition. Um, and the way in which they're dealt with by, uh, by communities is um, the whole sort of graveyards were, uh, the graves were disinterred and the bodies were staked and uh, decapitated and cremated. Um, but there are also qualities um, such as being able, um, the, the, the whole notion that they couldn't go out in sunlight is a, is a, is a later uh, um, sort of uh, development. Um, they normally, um, in the earlier accounts, appear between the hours of uh, midday and midnight, um, so they can pass through a locked door, uh, for example. And they also tended to strangle their victims and then suck the blood afterwards. They didn't the, the notion of uh, biting somebody's neck uh, is again, that's, that's a later um, innovation. Um, so they are, and they, they, they think they've been stranglers um, and then um, blood suckers rather than um, as the feasting on gore. Is there a, a relationship between redheads and vampirism? Um, I don't think it with red hair, um, but it's certainly um, worth noting that although we may think of vampires as very cadaverous and pale today, um, and certainly the depiction of them tends to show them as, as having that uh, corpse-like uh, quality to the skin. Um, in fact, they were they were seen as being very rosy hued um, in in the earlier accounts. Um, so would have um, tend to have red faces because they were engorged um, on blood. Um, in fact, I think there's a Serbian uh, saying which is um, uh, talking about uh, people who drink too much <laughs> as being as red as a vampire uh, because they have that particular complexion. I have a. Uh a fact here, it says, um, the Oxford Dictionary, the word vampire makes its first presence in 1734. And, and what was that a result of? Um, it's actually, I've written to the dictionary, it's 1732, uh, the 11th of March, 1732. So that's when it first appears in London um, in, um, in an account uh, which um, is describing uh, the dead emerging from their graves and preying on the living. So it's, in, it's a newspaper report, and it's that, that's the first instance uh, of the word. Um, and then it's taken up very quickly as this political metaphor um, to be um, as a way of uh, trying to understand um, how uh, criticism um, of oppressive governments uh, can be expressed. Um, and so it, it very quickly enters the political language um, of, of Great Britain, and so a whole range um, of different uh, areas, um, such as um, exporting goods and uh, foreign traders and uh, uh, stock investors, uh, government ministers are described as vampires. Um, and then they sort of move up the social scale. Um, so you have you know, theatre critics and booksellers and uh, managers um, and uh, uh, op commissioned officers in the army and so forth, as well as um, those working in the church being described um, as vampires. Um, and in that sense, they, 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 they move up the social scale until they get to the, to the aristocracy, uh, which is one of the innovations that John Polidori introduces in 1819 by modeling his vampire on Lord Byron. Um, and then he becomes much more of a, a sort of sexual um, predator, uh, and I say aristocratic, uh, wealthy, and apparently beyond the law. There's so much literature out there about vampires. Who do you like to read? Well, I'm actually preparing a collection of vampire tales at the moment. Um, so that's a, there's a whole series um, of vampire tales that predate um, Dracula. I will be including Marjorie O'Quever in that, which I think is... That, that, that's probably my favorite vampire story, um, not least because it ends on the worst pun ever in English literature, which I'm not going to tell you. <laughs> it's just well worth reading the story, uh, which you can find uh, um, online. 
um, ju- just just because of the pun. Um, and in fact, puns do appear in other vampire um, tales as well. In Robert Louis Stevenson uh, wrote Alala, which uh, is full of these. The little word vampire is never used. Um, there is there are cunning on similar sorts of words uh, that uh, just raise the possibility uh, that this is a vampire tale. Uh, more recently, Hilary Mantel uh, has a uh, has, a, has a written a vampire tale um, in her collection of short recent collection of short stories. Um, so all of those um, I think are um, are important. Uh, but uh, I'd also say Pete Murphy is you know, probably my favourite vampire. The uh, with the Rock Band Bauhaus. One of the diseases well, that... Uh, go ahead, I'm sorry. No, that's it really. <laughs> one, of, one of the diseases <laughs> that... that, 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 that yeah. Of course, I mean, if you look at the recent... Uh, sorry, if you look at goth music, um, it was Bauhaus that really kicked off the whole um, goth um, subculture. Um, with their vampire anthem, Bella Lugosi is Dead, which is about vampires and the representation of vampires in film. Um, and uh, so uh, they, they are very much at the, at the beginning of that, um, alongside Vampire the Damned, for example, that have Dave Vadian um, singing uh, with him, uh, modeling his name on the Transylvania, and again looking like Bella Lugosi, uh, the, uh, the vampire movie actor. Um, so um, I'm, I'm very interested in those popular cultural uses. Um, of the whole figure. Fairly uncommon disease now, but one that um, affected the royal family, you know, but, um, was also linked to um, vampirism, was um, perfor- or it's porphyria. What's what's the relationship there? Yes, yeah, so this porphyria is possibly uh, what um, George III um, suffered from. Um, and certainly some commentators have suggested uh, that it could be um, porphyria, uh, that, um, that undiagnosed porphyria um, could be mistaken for vampirism um, in earlier periods because of the, uh, the fact that the gums um, shrink, that so the teeth look like they're elongated, um, the skin hue changes, um, and so forth. Um, which is all very plausible, except porphyria is incredibly rare. Um, and when you're looking at these early outbreaks, it's whole communities that are taken over uh, by vampirism. It's not uh, just one or two um, isolated instances. Uh, the fear is that they are um, whole, um, you know, whole villages um, or areas of towns uh, which, are, which are infested. And that just doesn't uh, follow um, the, uh, the way that something like porphyria um, is going to present itself. So it's much more likely to be um, a way of trying to understand um, mass contagion um, of some sort uh, rather than a particular syndrome such as that. I've had a handful of professors on this podcast who um, have varied interests in, in, in different things that would normally not think of part of their uh, part of their study, but uh, being a full professor at a university in modern times has been a career sort of noted by um, traditional academic studies. Um, how does this relate to your, your, your studies and... Um, don't you think that now is, is a great time more than ever to um, introduce some of these other topics that have been part of our oral and, and, and written history that we normally haven't studied in the past? Yes, I mean, I think that, 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 that that's really the role. Um, I mean, not only of university professors, but I think of educators and uh, writers, um, filmmakers uh, more, more generally. Um, it's a show that these things are relevant today. Um, and um, it's not um, just uh, some form of, you know, sort of historical or archaeological excavation. But in order to understand where we are now, uh, we, we need to, uh, to actually see things in there, to see the longer history um, of things, and also to, uh, to take, for example, areas of popular culture very seriously. Um, so, I mean, what I would hope, um, and I hope you can see this in the vampire book, it's also something I try to do in my writings on the Gothic uh, more generally, um, is I'm, I'm, I'm writing for the readers of tomorrow um, and hoping, and also writing, I hope, for uh, what you might call common readers, not for um, students and undergraduates, but for people who are just simply interested. And that's one of the reasons why I'm writing um, a lot for the trade press um, and why I'm happy to do things like um, interviews, podcasts, um, recordings, and so forth. Because I think that 
and getting that thinking out there is the important thing. Um, and it enables people um, to, to make up their own minds. Absolutely. The book is A Vampire, A New History, which is available on Amazon.com. It's an authoritative new history of vampires 200 years after it first appeared on the literary scene. Professor Nick Groom, thank you very much for joining me, and I'm going to give you the last word tonight, please. Well, it's been a pleasure talking to you, um, but I just want to um, just give you a couple of um, little comments. Um, I mean, on the serious side, um, philosophers talk about us being in the Anthropocene, um, that uh, humans have changed the world irrevocably. Um, I think that we might be in something called the vampiracy because we have transformed the world, but in doing so we've lost supremacy of it. Um, and thinking about vampires can actually put us um, down and think about our relations uh, with um, other um, creatures, with other beings, with other life forms um, on, on the earth and perhaps renegotiate um, those. Um, in doing so, I think that it, it's going to change the way that we think um, at least I hope it will. Because I want to introduce sort of some sense of enchantment uh, back into the back into the world, and um, a sense of the the, the importance of um, the unknowable, the importance of uh, investigating, um, and the importance of knowledge um, as, as ways of enhancing and enriching um, our lives. So that's sort of, that's a serious point. Um, the less serious point to to think of, and which shows that vampires do get everywhere, um, is that. Um, there was um, a belief in Eastern Europe that it wasn't just people or livestock that we could become vampirized, but also agricultural tools could, and also pumpkins. And if you leave a pumpkin for more than nine days, it will become a vampire. But as the, uh, one of the historians has pointed out, people weren't actually that afraid of vampire pumpkins because they couldn't really chase you. Professor Nick Groom, thank you so much. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. You can find my website at www.myalienlifepodcast.com and please subscribe to my latest downloads at iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, and at podbean.com. And please follow me and like me on Facebook and Twitter. My Alien Life is written and produced for broadcast at Studio 254 in the Northern Rocky Mountains. The music you are hearing is produced and created by Elion. You can find all Elion's work online at Heart Dance Records. Music